welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Friday, September 1st, we are studying Leviticus chapter 5, verse 14, through chapter 6, verse 30. In today's text, the Lord teaches his people concerning guilt offerings, and he begins to give the priests further instructions concerning particular sacrifices. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Caleb Adams. Pastor Adams serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Bend, Oregon. Pastor Adams, welcome back to Sharper Iron. It's good to be back with you. Thanks for having me again. So tell tell us a little bit about the book of Leviticus, Pastor Adams. What should we know as we prepare to look at this section of text? <laughs> well, we are in for a treat, is I guess the first thing we should probably say. But right. um, yeah, we I don't know that we often look at Leviticus that way. Leviticus is a, a pretty tough book. And it was interesting as I was uh, you know preparing for this, I was reading some commentaries and different uh, books and articles that have been written about Leviticus and was reminded of just how, how harsh a book it is. You know, there's so many sacrifices and blood and rules and regulations. There's not a lot of theological explanation given in Leviticus as to why all of this is there. So does it even apply to us today? How much of it applies? How does it apply? Um, we came across a f- couple of good quotes uh, from the church father origin. He said, if you read people passages from the divine books that are good and clear, they will hear them with great joy, but provide someone a reading from Leviticus, and at once the listener will gag and push it away as if it were some bizarre food. Um, and he, of course, then goes on to to talk about the value of Leviticus and how this is not the appropriate reaction, but it is kind of our our instinctive reaction, I think. Um, Reed Lessing describes it in, in his intro to the Old Testament as the liver and onions book of the Bible. It must be good for us, but we just don't seem to have a taste for the stuff. <laughs> um, but I think when we, when we see Leviticus in its, in its proper place and understand it as, as God desires us to, we see um, that it is a book about the incredible love that our holy God has for us as, as unholy people apart from him um, and his desire to repair our relationship with him that we have broken by our sin to, uh, to restore the, the fellowship that, that he created us for. And so to, yeah. to uh, bookend it with another church father quote, Jerome says in Leviticus, almost every syllable breathes the heavenly mysteries because it figure, its figures lead us to Christ, the one great high priest of the New Testament. And so uh, in Leviticus, the, the sacrifices, the blood, all of these things point us to the, the holiness of God. You know, God gives us these sacrifices as, as a means, as sacraments really to to impart his holiness, to communicate that to us. And, uh, and all of the, the different instructions that are given are meant to, uh, to point us to these divinely mandated means of receiving God's blessings of forgiveness and atonement. And of course, to, to point us to Christ. Um, Leviticus 17, 11 is kind of a key verse. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Mm. I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. And if that verse is not pointing us to the, the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us, then, then I don't know what is. Um, yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. I think when we understand, um, you know, all of these things that are at first kind of off-putting for us as pointing us to Jesus, as all of scripture does, um, we start to, to uh, allow the word to flourish as, as God desires for it to. In today's text, we find ourselves at the end of chapter 5 and then the whole of chapter 6. Where does that put us in the book of Leviticus? Where have we been? What's Moses? What kind of instructions is the Lord giving through Moses here? Yeah, so Leviticus um, really just gets going right off the bat. It says, you know, the Lord called Moses and said to him, and then just gets going with all these different instructions. Um, in fact, the the book is known um, by the, the first Hebrew word of the book, uh, the Hebrew name for the book is Vayikra, which means that he called, you know, and, and Yahweh called Moses. And so 
um, all of Leviticus is God speaking directions to Moses, God speaking to us. And so um, instead of focusing on the Levites as much, perhaps focusing on God's calling and, and words to us are helpful. Um, the context of chapters five and six really is is the end of maybe what we might we might call the first uh, main section of Leviticus, where where God goes through all the different types of offerings that that the people are to offer to Him. It starts out with the burnt offerings, goes on to the grain offerings, the peace offerings, the sin offerings, um, kind of giving details on what each one of these offerings are and how they're supposed to be offered up to the Lord. And then um, in our text today, starting in chapter five, verse fourteen, the focus shifts over to guilt offerings, which we'll talk quite a bit about. And then our text ends today with chapter six with some specific instructions to the priest in particular. Yeah, so there is a bit of a transition within our text today. In the Hebrew text, chapter 5 actually goes all the way through what we have in our English text as 6 verse 7, and highlights that maybe a little more clearly than than the way the chapter and verse divisions work in our English text. But we do have a bit of, of two sections here. First, some more instructions concerning a particular type of offering, the guilt offering, and we'll read that section first. And then we'll jump in really to the next section, which begins in 6 verse 8, again in the English text, which then kind of goes back through some of the things that we've read before, but with more instructions given especially to the priests and the way that they are to carry out these sacrifices that the Lord has has described already in the book. So with those things in mind, we take up the first section of our text today. This is now the text beginning at Leviticus 5, verse 14. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation a ram without blemish out of the flock, valued in silver shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for a guilt offering. He shall also make restitution for what he has done amiss in the holy thing, and shall add a fifth to it and give it to the priest. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. If anyone sins, doing any of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he did not know it, Then realizes his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. He shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish out of the flock, or its equivalent for a guilt offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for the mistake that he made unintentionally, and he shall be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He has indeed incurred guilt before the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor, in a matter of deposit or security, or through robbery, or if he has oppressed his neighbor, or has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, in any of all the things that people do and sin thereby, if he has sinned and has realized his guilt, and will restore what he took by robbery, or what he got by oppression, or the deposit that was committed to him, or the lost thing that he found, or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full, and shall add a fifth to it and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. And he shall bring to the priest as his compensation to the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock, or its, a, or its equivalent for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any of the things that one may do, and thereby become guilty. That is where we'll pause. That takes us through Leviticus chapter 6 verse 7. So, Pastor Adams, plenty to talk about here. These are called guilt offerings. Uh, One of the things that stands out right away, especially in that first thing that the Lord tells Moses, is that we're talking especially about unintentional sins, at least in the first two instances. Uh, Talk to us about what sins are in mind that would bring about the need to do a guilt offering. Yeah, so both of these first two offenses mentioned are, are a little vague. The first one seems to have a little bit more um, that we can go on is to understand what's being referenced here. Um, very clearly, what they both have in common is unintentionality, um, sins that are committed, not not premeditated, not with intent to disobey God's commands, um, but out of neglect or something like that. So um, the Hebrew word ma'al is used uh, for the first one and really has the sense of disloyalty or, or unfaithfulness, infidelity, um, usually in reference to disloyalty toward Yahweh, uh, toward misuse of sacred objects devoted to Yahweh. 
And so uh, it seems that that the first one might be specifically talking about uh, neglecting to tithe or not bringing the required offerings that God has commanded, um, accidentally mixing, you know, what is holy with what is unholy. In Leviticus, we get this this very tangible sense of holiness. It's something you can touch. It's something that's transferred that that we'll see later on in our reading today. And so um, I know personally, whenever I've read Leviticus and and some of the other instructions in the Torah, um, I've been very thankful to the Lord for allowing me to be born in, in you know, the 20th century AD, because I, I'm sure I would have messed up quite often. And so I think that's exactly what, what God is doing here is, is giving his people a way to atone for their, I would guess, many mistakes in these areas. Um, it immediately called to mind for me, Psalm 19, verse 12, who can discern his errors, declare me innocent from hidden faults. Um, a verse the reformers, of course, reference when talking about the the church's demand to enumerate every single sin. Um, we we can't discern our errors or um, you know know all of our hidden faults. In this case, the guilt offerings seem to be for for those unintentional errors that later do uh, come to the people's attention. And so God's giving a a sacrifice to His people as a blessing to them to uh, to provide them a, a means of atonement and. And even, I, I think it's fair to say, those with an, an uneasy conscience, those who maybe are not quite sure if they've done everything that the law requires of them, um, if there's been any misstep whatsoever, God has provided a, a way to to atone for that through this, this guilt offering, which is uh, very unique when compared to the other offerings. Talk a little bit about the name given to this particular sacrifice, the guilt offering. What's intended by that name? Yeah, so... It's it's interesting because, you know, of the different offerings in Leviticus, there seems to be some crossover in terms of how they're described, um, how they're enacted. Uh, but the guilt offering here is is a very specific offering. Um, and the, the Hebrew word here is asham. Uh, it's usually translated as guilt offering. Um, sometimes it's translated as reparation offering, um, in a few cases, even trespass offering um, and Reparation is is sometimes the translation because of what goes along with this offering. Uh, that this seems to be these these first two instances certainly for unintentional sins, but also ones that that restitution can be made for, um, and that becomes especially clear in in the third one that we'll get to. Um, but the Hebrew word asham in the first place is is actually the word used to refer to guilt that is incurred by human sin, and uh, so. Guilt offering, I think, is is probably the best way to translate it, as long as we understand you know, the meaning behind all of that, um, because the word is uh, used not only to refer to guilt, but it's also used as as here to describe the penalty required to to compensate for that guilt that's incurred um, and or the, the sacrifice that needs to be offered. And so um, even though it does get a little murky at times, especially um, looking at it in, in our case over 3000 years later, um, there, there is a pretty clear distinction between the sin offering and, and the guilt offering. Um, my favorite thing about the word asham is, is that it's found in Isaiah 53, verse 10, that, that beautiful fourth servant song, um, where Isaiah says that the suffering servant's life is made a, a guilt offering, an asham, for our sake. Um, and so these guilt offerings, as, as everything else in all of Scripture and, and everything that God has to to give to us in Leviticus, point us to to Christ Jesus, to His sacrifice, and and to all that He has done, and, and a couple other um, interesting things about the guilt offering that that do that as well is is this is uh, the only offering that's mentioned here in Leviticus where only a ram is allowed. Um, for all of the other offerings, you know there there are options, and it might depend on your your station in in life or your societal rank, but here. Um, it, it's a ram in every case. Um, the guilt offering is always given by an individual, not by the congregation, as is the case with other offerings. And uh, and again, with that reparation included, uh, 20% restitution is required on top of this animal sacrifice in the case of the guilt offerings. Mm. Talk more about that, that reparation, the 20% restitution that's to go on top of it. How does that work here? Yeah, so in in the first case here of, of the the three offenses that are mentioned in in what we're looking at right now, um, it's the ram uh, valued by the temple, and then twenty percent on top of that. And so 
um, you take a fifth of whatever the value is and and add that on and give it to the priest. Um, as we get on to the third, we'll see that that, that restitution actually goes to the, the offended um, neighbor. Uh, but in this first case, the, the restitution goes to the priest. And, and it's interesting, there's some some commentary that talks about, um, well, what exactly happens to all this money? Do, do the priests just end up you know, living kind of a Joel Osteen life or something like that? And, um, and I'm sure in some cases, you know, of course there was, was corruption. And we see in the time of Josiah that the priests have not been uh, using these funds as they should have all along. And Josiah in his reforms uh, tries to correct that. But, but the Mishnah uh, says that to avoid unduly enriching the priest, this money that, that was given was used to purchase these whole burnt offerings uh, for the altar, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, all of which were dedicated to the Lord. So at least in theory, um, these, these funds of restitution in, in the first and, uh, and maybe second cases were used for, uh, for the work of, of the, the Levites, the priest in, in the tabernacle and, and later on the temple. Sure. And, and we've seen that in other offerings, how the Lord, in certain cases, reserves a portion of the offering for the physical support of the priests, the Levites, those working there at the temple. And so for there to be actual money as a part of that, too, would make sense that it would go then toward either the support of the priests or the daily operation of what happens at the tabernacle or the temple in the case of, of this restitution, this reparation. Now, at the end of the, the first one, we hear that through this guilt offering— the priest makes atonement for the, the sinner who's brought the offering with the ram, and he is forgiven. Talk about this matter of atonement and forgiveness. Yeah, of course, it's a it's a persistent theme throughout Leviticus and throughout God's giving of the sacrificial system that, that atonement is made uh, through the sacrifice and this restitution, and, and the priest is the agent of, of that atonement. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I know for me, when I— when I think of atonement, I can't help but think of, um, you know, what what I'm sure many of us have heard that atonement is at one meant we are at one with God again. Um, and I've often equated atonement with forgiveness, um, but actually the the two there is a distinction um, here. Both are mentioned. The priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. Um, atonement really has a little bit more. Than simply forgiveness in view, it, it really implies this this decontamination, this cleansing, uh, both physically and spiritually. Um, we tend to think of of our sin and and our unholiness as as simply a spiritual matter, but Leviticus makes it clear it goes much deeper than that. And and so what what God has provided through the sacrificial system, of course, as as a type pointing to to Jesus Christ as the one who will come and and atone for our sin and forgive it once and for all um, really is, is a pretty incredible blessing here. So uh, the priest is, is privileged to be the one dispensing this forgiveness, uh, administering this, this cleansing that God desires to give to his people. Now, as, as we move into the second case in which a guilt offering could be given, the way that the English text reads, if anyone sins, doing any of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he did not know it, then realizes his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. That one seems a little more vague than the first. What what might be in view here? Yeah, it, it does seem to be pretty vague. So, I, I mean, I would say this has to do with you know any particular offense, again, where um, unintentionally someone has sinned against the Lord. But generally, as people have read Leviticus, they would pair this with the first one in, in some way or other and uh, suggests that it seems to have the general sense of desecration of, of sacred areas or objects kind of in the, the overall context of Leviticus and um, just the best, uh, best guess that we seem to be able to put together. Um, but something that's, that's clear here again is that, um, and it's I think clearer in this case than in the first one, is that ignorance is, is not an excuse. Um, unintentional sin is still sin. Uh, one is found guilty even if the guilt is not come by on purpose. You know, verse 19 just really makes that clear. It is a guilt offering. He has indeed incurred guilt before the Lord. And it's made me think of somebody who contracts a disease without their knowledge. Um, and they still suffer from that disease. The disease is still going to uh, bring about its its effects and its symptoms. And 
the disease still needs to be dealt with and purged away despite the sufferer's initial ignorance. So um, this seems to be the same sort of case here. You know, unintentional sin still needs to be dealt with, atoned for, forgiven. Um, calls to mind infant baptism as well, <laughs> that uh, yeah. the baby's ignorance of their own sinful condition does not negate the need for that sinful condition to be to be washed away by by the means you know through the means which god has given us to do so right so then for that second case once again as you mentioned earlier it's a ram without blemish out of the flock that is to be brought atonement is made by the priest through this guilt offering as we move then into chapter six which again connects to the previous two very well we're still in the matter of guilt offerings and, and here we've got a, a different kind of sin, it seems, though there's, there's probably a connection to what's come before. What's the, this third scenario that the first part of chapter 6 deals with? It, it is interesting. There is a, a pretty uh, sharp distinction between these first two and this, this third one. The first two are unintentional. This third is very clearly intentional. Um, what seems to be the common thread holding them together is that all three of these are sins uh, where restitution is possible. And so this third one, um, as I look at it, seems to deal primarily with sins against the seventh commandment, uh, particularly center, centering around money and, and human greed. Uh, so deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security through robbery. If he's oppressed his neighbor, found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, um, any of these things, you know, once, once the guilt is realized, then, then reparations, restoration must be made. And, um, church, it sent me to the, the small catechism on the seventh commandment. Uh, we should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, uh, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way, which uh, I'm realizing right now in my notes, that's actually, I believe, the explanation of the eighth commandment. And uh, <laughs> perhaps true. that's a that's a divine um, <laughs> mistake that God's using my unintentional sin to, to work his purposes, because I think that actually applies rather well here as well, um, as it talks about swearing falsely and, um, and oppressing our neighbor. Um, certainly, you know, we could, we could go on to the ninth commandment while we're at it and um, talk about coveting as well. We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right but help and be of service to him in keeping it. Um, so whether the seventh, eighth, or ninth, or for that matter, any of the other commands of God, um, when those are violated and our neighbor is harmed uh, by our actions or lack of actions, um, God's will for, for what we are to do with that is very clear. Um, Leviticus 19.18 um, you know, famously says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And here, you know what, 14 chapters earlier, God's giving a, 13 chapters earlier, God's giving a very um, concrete example of what that looks like. And uh, yeah. it's, it's an immediate thing too, right? As, as soon as uh, the guilt is realized, on the day he realizes his guilt, how often do we realize mm -hmm. in retrospect that we've done something wrong and then, then struggle to, uh, to make it right or wonder if maybe we can get away with not making it right? God's will for us is clear. On the, the day you realize your guilt, uh, go and and try to repair that relationship with with our neighbor. Yeah, yeah. To to the matter of the the commandments that you brought up, uh, as you said, you you did read the explanation of the eighth commandment. But that matter of, <laughs> of what we say, I you know, both to our neighbor that that is involved in what's going on in these these various sins against the seventh commandment is also what we what we would confess to our neighbor and also what we would confess to God. Dr. Kleinig in his commentary connects this third part with the first two, where the first two, as you mentioned, have to do with desecrating the holy things of God. The matter of swearing falsely would be desecrating the holiness of God's name. And so certainly that then plays into the the sins against the neighbor as well, these false oaths that you would have taken saying, no, I didn't do this. In fact, you did. That then requires the, the restoration of the relationship with the neighbor and with God. So to talk about how this, this goes in the guilt offering in these sins against neighbor in this part of chapter six. Yeah, well, and, and that highlights very well, I think the, the Coram Mundo and the Coram Deo aspect of the guilt offerings, you know, we have the two kinds of righteousness at play here. God desires um, not only uh, 
restoration of our relationship with one another, but, um, but atonement to be made before him. And so um, the, the two go hand in hand and, and are really inseparable, even though we, we try to separate them quite a bit. You know, if I'm forgiven by God, then, then that's all that's necessary. Um, but God reminds us in a lot of ways throughout scripture that, that he desires our relationships here to be reconciled as well. Um, you know, Jesus wasn't coming up with some new theology or um, sharing a, a brand new teaching that, that God had never revealed to us before when he pointed out the connection between the first and the second great commandments, right? Love the Lord, your God, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, these two things go together. And, uh, and so in this case, like the previous two, um, 20% of fifth is to be added to the value. And in this case, it would be, you know, if somebody stole an, an object from, from their neighbor, whatever the value of that object is, the object is returned. And then, um, 20% of the value is added onto that. And that made me think of Zacchaeus and, you know, in the new Testament where Zacchaeus, uh, stands up before Jesus and says, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And so, um, you know, we, we sometimes as new Testament Christians think, well, God said this in the old Testament, what can I get away with in the, the new Testament era? Zacchaeus shows us the the proper disposition toward these things. Um, right. We should be be eager uh, to restore to our brothers what we've stolen. Um, Jesus said the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. And I think also in, in view here, maybe implied more than explicitly stated is. Uh, the role of the person who's been wronged, uh, clearly their, their expectation, the expectation God has for such a person is, is to receive and accept the restitution uh, rather than to refuse forgiveness. Uh, we forgive those who trespass against us. And, and as our relationship with, with our, our fellow man is restored, um, our relationship with God is, is healed as well. Um, as with the other offerings, uh, there's also compensation made to the Lord. It's a reminder that, that every sin is ultimately a sin against God. Psalm 51, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And, and yet here we've had two unintentional sins and God offers forgiveness, but, but how beautiful that here very obviously intentional sins um, are provided a means for forgiveness, restitution to our neighbor and, and to the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So God in his mercy gives opportunity for forgiveness, for atonement. Things are brought right between the sinner and him and between the sinner and others. We're going to keep looking at this chapter of Leviticus on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Caleb Adams this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Lutheran Church Extension Fund exists to support Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and church workers. How do we do this? Your investment with LCEF makes it possible for LCMS churches, schools, organizations, and church workers to receive low-cost loans for new and growing ministries. And faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, make that possible when you invest with LCEF. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, September 1st. We're studying Leviticus chapter 5, verse 14 through chapter 6, verse 30 with Pastor Caleb Adams. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Bend, Oregon. Pastor Adams, prior to the break, we read the text and studied up through chapter 6, verse 7. There is a bit of transition that takes place now, so we turn to the rest of the text, beginning now in Leviticus 6, verse 8. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, 
This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth of the on the altar all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and put his linen undergarment on his body, and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall arrange the burnt offering on it and shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. Fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. And this is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord in front of the altar. And one shall take from it a handful of the fine flour of the grain offering and its oil and all the frankincense that is on the grain offering and burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the rest of it Aaron and his sons shall eat. It shall be eaten unleavened in a holy place. In the court of the tent of meeting they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my food offerings. It is a most it is a thing most holy, like the sin offering and the guilt offering. Every male among the children of Aaron may eat of it, as decreed forever throughout your generations, from the Lord's food offerings. Whatever touches them shall become holy. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This is the offering that Aaron and his sons shall offer to the Lord on the day when he is anointed. A tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a regular grain offering, half of it in the morning and half of it half in the evening. It shall be made with oil on a griddle. You shall bring it well mixed in baked pieces like a grain offering, and offer it for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The priest from among Aaron's sons, who is anointed to succeed him, shall offer it to the Lord as decreed forever. The whole of it shall be burned. Every grain offering of a priest shall be wholly burned. It shall not be eaten. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed shall be the sin offering, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. In a holy place it shall be eaten, in the court of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches its flesh shall be holy. And when any of its blood is splashed on a garment, you shall wash that on which it was splashed in a holy place. And the earthenware vessel in which it is boiled shall be broken. But if it is boiled in a bronze vessel, that shall be scoured and rinsed in water. Every male among the priests may eat of it. It is most holy. But no sin offering shall be eaten from which any blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place. It shall be burned up with fire. That takes us to the end of our text, to Leviticus 6, verse 30. All right, Pastor Adams, there's a bit of a transition here. What's the transition that's made? And take us into the first part of this section. Yeah, so up to this point, uh, God's really been describing each of the types of offerings that the people are to give. And then here in, in verse 8, there's a transition to instruction specifically for the priest. Uh, so the key words here are, are command Aaron and his sons. And we see that a few times in our text, and it will go on um, into chapter 7 as well. Um, the instructions leading up to this point were really for, for every Israelite and this section is really more of a, a manual for the priest as to how to go about uh, offering up these different offerings that, that God has given to his people. Hmm. So the, the first section then, as the Lord speaks to Moses, he says, command Aaron and his sons, this is the law of the burnt offering. Talk to us about what the priests are told concerning the burnt offering. Yeah, so the burnt offering is the first offering mentioned in the book of Leviticus. And uh, if anyone's interested, the Hebrew word here is Ola. And so uh, a good way to remember that is uh, the Spanish word Ola means hello. So just think hello, burnt offering. And there you go. Now you know the Hebrew word for burnt offering. Uh, but the burnt offering is an offering that is offered by the priest and consumed completely um, by the fire. Um, all of it is burned. And these offerings were given uh, once in the morning, once at night, every single day um, throughout Israel's history is, is what uh, God commanded back in Exodus 29, that, that a lamb would be offered in the morning and at twilight. It would be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. And so 
Uh, these burnt offerings are our whole offerings. All of it is, is dedicated to the Lord. Um, it, it's interesting that in connection with this burnt offering, uh, this continual fire is mentioned a couple of times. And, you know, in verse 9 and in verse 13 explicitly that, that the fire is to be burning all night. Uh, the fire shall, shall never be put out. It kind of reminds me of the Olympic torch or something like that. Yep. This is, yeah. you know, the, the fire that's that's never going to go out. A lot of our congregations and our churches have kind of the eternal light that I think springs from from this initially that of course represents the the presence of God with us always um, what's the significance of this continual fire that's used for the burnt offering there seem to be a lot of different possibilities it could be a, a, a sign of God's continual presence with his people that he never leaves uh, it could be I think certainly is in some ways a sign of the people's continual need for forgiveness and atonement that that human sin never uh, runs out of of its mm. need for for expiation. Mm. Um, some some would say that this fire also represents the people's prayers that are continually rising before God. I think of evening prayer. May our prayers rise before you as incense. Um, and certainly, I I think that. Not only God's presence, but certainly God's continual forgiveness of his people, just the the general disposition that God has toward his people of, of graciousness and mercy. Uh, we are certainly reminded of that every time we uh, we are told about the, the continual fire burning uh, yeah. on the altar. Yeah. yeah, and this will be fire that at the end of Levit- Leviticus chapter 9 we'll see this fire actually come from the presence of the Lord. So it's not the, the fire that, that we make, yeah. it's the fire that he gives. And so you, you keep that gift going and he keeps that gift going for his people. It's also, I mean, you know, you see within this, not only those theological realities, the very practical reality of the need to, to remove the ashes, because otherwise, I mean, how do you keep a fire going? If you don't remove ashes, add fuel, those kinds of practical realities are also in play. But to, again, to show that there's theological reality, even more than that, the matter of what the priest is to wear comes into play. Why the changes of clothes during the process of moving ashes, bringing wood back, and all those things? Yeah, it's interesting here that God commands a, a wardrobe change for his priests as they go about their duties, that you know, they're wearing their, their typical holy garments as they minister before the Lord and his altar. But when it's time to take the ashes outside, um, God actually tells them, uh, to change that that uh, not only is keeping their holy garments on for that trip um, unnecessary, it's also inappropriate. And this is one of many examples in Leviticus where God clearly demarcates the the holy and the common as two very separate categories. And uh, what is appropriate for one is is inappropriate for the other, uh, which does I think shine a little bit of light for us on those offenses back in chapter five, where it talks about, you know, a breach of faith or something like that, this sort of thing seems to be in view, not specifically for the priests necessarily, but for, for God's people as a whole, when they, when they mess up in the areas of what is common and what is holy. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So that's, what's going on there with the burnt offering. And again, further instructions given to the priests specifically concerning that burnt offering. Then in verses 14 and following, the Lord begins to give instructions concerning a grain offering, and we've heard about grain offerings in the book of Leviticus, but at least one of these is is a distinct one that the priest is going to be, it's going to be for the high priest himself. So talk to us about the the grain offerings that are mentioned here in in chapter 6. Yeah, chapter 6 talks about um, two distinct types of grain offerings. It it first deals with kind of the the typical grain offering that the people would bring, and how uh, the priests start to to eat of that, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But then, then it deals with uh, this offering that the priests themselves are to bring um, in verses nineteen through twenty three. Um, they're to to bring this offering to the Lord um, every day from the day of their ordination on. And in this case, um, this grain offering really becomes like a a burnt offering. It is burned completely and and not eaten at all and uh, in hebrews actually chapter 7 it seems to be referring to probably this particular offering where it says that that jesus has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily first for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered up himself and so uh 
yeah, we have this perpetual um, burnt offering that takes place morning and night uh, before the Lord. And then the priests themselves offer this perpetual grain offering as they um, seek atonement for their sins as they are chosen as the ministers to to bring God's atonement to others. Um, and in that in that capacity, then uh, they do eat of the the remnant of the grain offerings that are offered up to the Lord. And uh, I was interested to discover that uh, the Hebrew verb akal, which means to eat, appears 29 times um, in Leviticus 6, verse 8 through the end of chapter 7. Um, eating is actually a, a major theme of, of this section. And we talked earlier about how the priests were, um, were given money for some of the restitution that was paid um, with the guilt offering. Um, here, we're specifically told about how the priests were given food to eat. And it was specifically the priests. It wasn't for just anyone. It wasn't for uh, the priest's families, even. It was it was for the priests themselves to eat of. And um, the priests certainly re received their livelihood afforded to them by the Lord through this. And Paul picks up on this a couple of times in the New Testament, uh, specifically in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And then first Timothy says something similar. And um, again, quotes the, the old Testament about muzzling an ox when it treads out the grain. So, um, so there's, there's continuity here in, in the church today. Um, but I think more than, more than the idea that that God is providing for the the livelihood of the priests, uh, just the the repeated mention of of eating and what happens when that eating takes place and the holiness kind of incumbent on all of that um, is a, a demonstration to us that God desires to to bring His holiness to us through things like eating. He wants to make us holy through tangible things, and so a, a very clear connection, <laughs> I would say, is. Is how we, as as God's people, um, the the royal priesthood, every one of us, receive into ourselves Christ's body and blood in communion. We are receiving His His holiness, and God is doing the same thing for us as as He did with the priests. Yeah, yeah. To the to the just briefly on the the second grain offering that's mentioned, the one that the priest needs to offer every day, morning and evening. It is it is striking how the the priest, the holiness. I mean, you think of the priest. So if there's ever anyone in the camp of Israel that's holy, got to be the priest. Well, even the priest has to receive holiness as a gift from the Lord, and, and he can never take it from granted, for granted. So, I mean, he gets ordained, installed into that office, but then every day he's maybe reassured of that holiness being given to him by the Lord. And then as you made the connection to the book of Hebrews and the way Jesus then surpasses that as the high priest who is without sin, that's just a fantastic connection. And I, just, again, thinking, and I know the, the line between the priest of the Old Testament and the office of the pastoral ministry, it's not a, a straight line. As you said, all of God's people are, are the royal priesthood. But there, there are elements of the priest of the Old Testament in which the office of the public ministry today does, does function. It's, it's just a wonderful reminder for us as pastors that you know, there's not some sort of special holiness given to us other than the one <laughs> that comes from God alone that all Christians have. Absolutely. Yeah, the the perpetual need for atonement that God impresses upon his priests in the Old Testament uh, continues on to us. It reminds me of how, you know, we speak of baptism. Baptism isn't a one-time thing that happened and and it it kind of stays there. It's a it's a daily experience. It's a daily drowning to to our sin you know, holding the old Adam under and arising to live, you know, the new blessed life that God has given to us because God, as he did in the old Testament continues to, to make us holy through these tangible means, you know, the sacrifices were, were sacraments in, in that sense. And we have the sacraments of, of baptism and, and Holy communion today. Um, you know, th that connection of, of food being something that can be holy, um, I mean, I guess the foodies among us would have agreed with that from the start, but um, <laughs> yeah, the, the the food offerings here and and God says that it's like the sin offering and the guilt offering as well, but he calls them most holy. Um, this isn't something that that we should just gloss over. This is this is a significant thing that that these food offerings are most holy and that that holiness is uh, 
is a tangible thing. It, it points us not only to the sacraments, but think of the ministry of Jesus. How many times did Jesus minister to someone through physical touch? I mean, I created my own little list here of ones that came to my mind. You know, the woman with the bloody discharge, the, the blind man whose eyes Jesus touches, Peter's mother-in-law he touches her and lifts her up and she serves. Um, people were bringing little children, even infants, Luke tells us, to Jesus specifically so that he could touch them and bless them. You know, Jesus heals Malchus's ear, the, the servant of the high priest, by, by touch. He raises the widow's son from the dead by touching the beer that you're not at all supposed to do, because not only does holiness transfer, so does uncleanness and, and death, and Jesus isn't afraid of it. Um, you know, God continues to, to touch his people with his holiness that is not our own. It is, it is alien. The priests were reminded of that every morning as they set out to, to serve their holy God, and, and we are privileged to do the same. Yeah, the, there's not everything in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus that's labeled, that's holy, is going to transfer the holiness to you. But as you pointed out, these things that are labeled most holy here, that is the direction. And, and of course, we can think of examples from the Old Testament where someone without the authority to do so reaches out and touches holy things, and then the holiness is destructive. But when God gives that authority to approach the holy things and you approach it according to his command and promise, then yeah, that holiness is received as a gift. And as you said, this is where for us, the sacraments, this is a wonderful example of God giving to us his holiness through these physical means. So that's true both of that first grain offering that's mentioned. It also is true, it's called most holy, the sin offering that's mentioned there in 24. And of course, it, it'll say later as the sin, so the guilt offering that's coming again in chapter 7. Talk to us more about the sin offering. That's the last offering that we get instructions about here in chapter 6. Yeah, and, and again, there seems to be a little bit of crossover between the sin offering and the guilt offering. The guilt offering specifically being um, having to do with you know, sins where restitution, reparation is possible somehow. But but sin offerings, um, unlike guilt offerings, could be offered not just by individuals. At times, sin offerings were offered up for, for the whole congregation, the whole nation of Israel. Um, and unlike the guilt offerings where it was a ram in every case, here the, the sacrifice would depend, as we said earlier, on the, the social ranking of the person giving the offering. Um, whether or not they can afford, you know, this offering or that offering, you know, the the doves as opposed to the goats or or things like that. Um, similar to the grain offering, the the priests are um, instructed by Yahweh to to eat um, portions of the sin offering again in in a holy place. Um, this is a, a most holy thing to the Lord, and so it should be consumed in in accordance with that. And and really this. Kind of points us ahead to uh, what's coming a little bit later on, where God will talk about Yom Kippur, the the Day of Atonement, and um, how the sins of of God's people are are placed on on a scapegoat. And uh, man, what a type of of Jesus there too that um, that He takes our contamination and and sin far away from us, and and just pours out on us freely by His grace, um, His own holiness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, with the matter of, of holiness transferring onto other things from these most holy offerings, how does that play into the matter of like garments getting splattered with blood or, I mean, the, the vessels in which things are cooked? How does that play in? Yeah, I mean, that seems to be some of the closing instructions here, that if, if blood splatters on, on a priest's garments as he's offering up these bloody sacrifices, which I would imagine happened probably far more often than not, yeah. um, God provides you know, instructions for what to do. These things are to be washed again in a holy place. Um, this isn't, you know, toss it in the laundry with, with the rest of your clothing. Um, this, is, this is a special um, arrangement that God gives. Um, even the, the vessels that contain, you know, the blood of these offerings are, were given specific instructions. If it's a, a clay pot or something that's porous, it can absorb some of that most holy blood then it should be broken and not used again. Um, but if it's a like a bronze pot or something like that, then you can scour it and, and rinse it with water and, and it could be put into use once again. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's kind of tricky, this, this transfer of holiness in Leviticus. Like you said, not everything holy transfers its holiness. It's not, not kind of a magic sort of thing. Um, it's, but it is a, a reminder that God 
tangibly deals with his people and and imputes his holiness his righteousness to us and um, he did so through <laughs> through his own son who came and and healed people by his touch and um, and was the the once and for all sacrifice for for all of us right yeah I mean the, the idea that the holiness transferring through touch is, is just a reminder of how well how other or different God's holiness is God's holiness that's that's what makes him unique. And so for us as human creatures, and especially sinful human creatures, to approach that holiness, the only way that we can expect that to be of any benefit to us is if we do so according to his command and promise. And so to see that, yes, when you do approach it in the way that God gives, here the priests especially, then it is a benefit to you. That's, I think, one of the the key takeaways, so that we would receive that holiness, again, as a gift from God, not something that we think we can just approach on our own or take or demand, but but purely as his gift to us. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of prayer. Prayer is not a, you know, a jukebox. You put in the the proper amount of coins and you get whatever song you want. It's it's relational. Our, our God is relational, and and so much so that he doesn't stand far off from us and have nothing to do with us, even though um, by all rights, he ought to, yeah. um, you know, his holy nature <laughs> would, would suggest that, that that's probably the way it has to be. But in his mercy, he comes to us and shares that holiness with us. I, one of the other things I was reminded of in all of this was that, that, that Hebrew word kadosh, uh, you know, the root of, of holy holiness um, is used as an adjective to describe God in the old Testament more than any other adjective mm. combined. Um, so this is, in a very real way, holiness is, is kind of the defining characteristic of our God yeah. and and to be set apart in such a way, and yet <laughs> to to share that with us, to invite us into fellowship with Him once again and, and to atone for our sin. We've got about two and a half minutes here on the morning, Pastor Adams. Help us to, to wrap things up on this section of Leviticus and point us to, to Christ through these words. Yeah, I think, you know, just maybe not specifically this section of Leviticus, but more Leviticus as a whole, um, you know, what what value does it have for us today? None of this sacrificial stuff is happening anymore. Um, these, you know, painstaking instructions given to the priests, are, are they really relevant to us? And um, of course, it's the word of God. And of course, they are. And so, um, you know, his origin helps us to see that we shouldn't gag and push it away, we should receive it with thanksgiving as we do the rest of God's word. And and what Leviticus in particular helps us to see is is that the the sacrificial system that was outlined, you know, there in the book was established by the the same God who came to to us uh, as as God sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for the world. And and so, you know, the way that that Jesus and, and the early church would apply, you know, what Jesus did for us um, takes into account Leviticus and what God communicates to us there, these these vocabulary words and theological categories that help us to understand in a in a fuller way, you know, the richness of of the sacrifice of Jesus uh, on our behalf that is has healed our relationship with Him. Um, I think more specifically to our text, there there seems to be quite a, a focus on God's interest in both our vertical relationship with Him and our horizontal relationship with one another. God's desire for, for peace between us and and our neighbor um, shows us that that we ought to desire the same thing that we should work toward the same thing, and that uh, that even intentional grossly intentional sins uh, can't stand in the way of of God's healing. Um, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is mended not only the the breach in our relationship with Him uh, with our Father, but but the broken relationship we have with others. And then, yeah, and then I think the the final thing that really stands out to me here is is again just that that tangibility of of holiness. Um, the the sacrificial gifts of God bring about holiness and wholeness for the people of Israel in Leviticus, and God hasn't changed His mo uh, as much as we sometimes think. Um, God continues to give us the body and blood of our Savior to consume for for the forgiveness of our sins to to receive this holiness that is outside of us um, to be invited back into fellowship with with the holy god and uh to take take all of that into our very selves um, so leviticus is if it is the liver and onions um, it's a it's a really good recipe that someone found that's right that's right very good recipe and very nutritious for our faith in <laughs> jesus christ
Pastor Caleb Adams is pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Bend, Oregon. He's been helping us today to study Leviticus chapter 5, verse 14, through chapter 6, verse 30. Pastor Adams, thanks for being our guest today. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about this section of Leviticus, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.